Talking today with William Greider, National Affairs Correspondent for The Nation, and also author of several of his former books, being Who Will Tell the People and Secrets of the Temple. He is in town to talk about his latest book, The Soul of Capitalism, Opening Paths to a Moral Economy. Uh, Bill, thank you for coming in hey, today. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. So tell us what is the motivation on your latest book, The Soul of Capitalism, Opening Paths to a Moral Economy. Well, you know, my previous books, I spent the last 20 years or more essentially examining power in this society, the powerful institutions, and how they influence, often overwhelm our lives in ways that we don't mostly understand. And those books are... Um, seem to people often dark and uh, sort of a little discouraging. And uh, that's not the message I wanted to leave in those books because I, I, I this is old fashioned and sounds quaint, but I actually do believe knowledge is power. <laughs> that, that people can't begin to get a hand on their reality and change it until they have some understanding of what's really going on inside the Federal Reserve or the or the kind of decayed politics of Washington, or the power relationships in the global economy. And each of those books had some bright beams of hope <laughs> pointed toward the alternatives. But this book is really a kind of front and center, from the guts argument about changing American capitalism. And and uh, I realize as I talk to people about it, I've got I got more of myself on the line in this book in a funny sort of way. I didn't realize that when, when I was writing it, but 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 I, but that's clearly the case. Um, it's an attempt to get people to sort of, and I know this is hard, but set aside for the moment the war, the economy, the the polarized politics in our country now, and 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 step back and look at the future beyond those events that is possible. And so I'm, I'm trying to take people to a mountaintop they haven't been in a long time, which is to really kind of re-envision what it is we want this very prosperous country to become. And I probably couldn't have plausibly written this book 20 years ago because the Cold War was still going. And people just, I mean, you just wouldn't get anybody to listen. Or you'd get some, but it would be such a, uh, a m marginal perspective. And people would frankly see it as subversive. That's over. We, we resolve that. For better or worse, capitalism is the triumphant system. So now let's look at capitalism and look at it critically, respectfully, all the rest, but really take on why this system, despite the abundance it generates, produces a country full of people sort of either stressed out or, or wounded or feeling trapped, confined in their routines. Um, and they feel the obligation to keep doing what they're doing and maybe take on another job as well. But it's not, it's not a terribly happy outlook. And it should be, right? This should be the best of all times, leave aside current controversies. Um, I think only partly because the Cold War ended, but, but fundamentally because where Americans are. I think we actually could be on on the edge already into a generational era of reform quite different from the ones in the 20th century that 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 goes into the guts of capitalism and changes it inside that's different from going to Washington and saying let's pass a regulation to stop these scoundrels from doing x y or z I'm not against doing that you understand but frankly, the prospect of it happening right now is pretty dim. They're, they're repealing the regulations or gutting them that were passed 20, 30 years ago, clean air and so forth. And uh, my proposition, which I think a lot of people are ready to believe, but a lot of people, just it's just too much for them to, to, to accept. But the proposition is this system is far more vulnerable to change than it pretends. And people have more potential power than they imagine. But you've got to know where the leverage points are. You've got to know what your real assets are. And then over time, 
people on the margins experimenting, going out the wall, getting their heads banged in, going again. I mean, this is very old history. Our people in this country, probably starting with the abolitionists, mm. have pursued that kind of politics. And it doesn't promise an early victory. <laughs> in fact, it may promise the opposite, that you're going to have to do this and do this again until enough of your fellow citizens understand the meaning of what you're trying to tell them. Um, I actually think this is going to be a lot easier than some of those earlier struggles, but I think it's pretty much got to start on the ground, bottom up, rather than uh, a petition to government. Now, state and local governments are different, be partly because they're not quite as ensnared in the corporate mentality, although many of them are, and partly because there's the proximity of the politics allows you to score more uh, points with the people who are elected. The kind of changes I'm talking about um, go to the malformed power relationships within capitalism, that is, who gets to make the decisions inside a company, who makes the decisions in Wall Street that, that are really the command center for, for the corporations. Um, how do you connect up ordinary folks institutionally with the money they own as investors. Um, each, each nest egg itself might be quite small, but collectively it, it's powerful. Workers, um, union or non-union, with a capacity to, to have voice within the company and to have a share of the ownership so that the wealth they're creating inside that company doesn't just flow out the door to selected insiders and the broad absentee owners we call shareholders. Um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we break open the production and consumption system, this marvelous society of goods, to get it to face what all, not all of us, but a lot of us believe is, the, is a sort of millennial crisis about ecology and the, and the fate of the earth. And some are doing that. It's not, it's not hopeless. But if you believe, uh, and I do, that we need a, re a genuine industrial transformation of both the products that are, the content of those products and the processes by which they're made. And the technologists who've been preaching on this theme for 30 or 40 years now uh, assure us that this is possible to achieve. The, why don't they happen? Why doesn't it happen? Well, there are a lot of arguments thrown in our face about costs and so forth and so on, but the, but the, but the real reason is the decision-making around those questions is controlled by a very small number of people who happen to be at the top of the auto industry or the electric utilities industry or who happen to be at a Wall Street bank or brokerage that make the terms for how money is lent and invested. That's what we've got to break open. So how do we, as citizens, then begin to start this ball rolling? Well, you have a lot of free spirits in the Northwest <laughs> this, in this area. Some of them have been working on this long before I came along, as you know. Um, what I do in the book, and this is really the, the, the basis of my optimism, in addition to trying to explain, to sort of break open the the, the, the beast we call capitalism and explain its working parts, but also to tell stories along the way of inventive social actors who are getting some leverage, some of it quite substantial, some of it just small and localized. And one of the stories of many I tell is about Rainforest Action Network. And they were really, I think, among the earliest to develop a very sophisticated strategy of how you connect consumers up to the fairly remote and large industrial corporations that are doing the damage. And, you know, people say buy green and, and all those other things, all of which I'm for, but, but over the last 30 years that hasn't exactly moved the mountain. Now I think they're beginning to move the mountain. Um, an example is the fight with the Boise Cascade where the Rainforest Action Network and, and allied alliances 
recognized that no amount of exhortation or picketing was going to change the hard heads at Boise Cascade. They have a notorious record for blowing off environmental regulation. They certainly weren't going to stop harvesting and selling old growth forest. That's, that's, the, that's the easiest profit there is. So instead, they, they go at what I call the middleman consumer. That's the Kinko's, Home Depot, IBM, lots of universities with allegedly a conscience, um, and a whole number of other corporations, all of which are big consumers of paper and wood products. And essentially, both by direct action, people in the parking lot with, with placards, and lots, thousands, tens of thousands of letters from consumers saying, how come Home Depot is holding out on this old growth forest issue? Do you really want to lose my business? You know, that kind of communication. And, and, it, and it reaches an intensity where those middle companies say, this isn't our fight. It doesn't really matter to us. We're getting out of the middle. And so then they sign up to the, to the policy objectives of, of uh, the activists and communicate that to, to the timber company. And typically, um, as happens, Boise Cascade sort of says, yeah, 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 and then goes on about its business. Then they start canceling contracts, big contracts, because the Kinkos and the Home Depots can't take the heat. They are, they are frontline retailers selling to the mass public, and even if they can't determine how much of their consumer base cares intensely about this, they don't want to lose 5 or 10 percent to find out, you know? I mean, it's just that's not a good transaction for them. So just a couple of weeks ago, Boise Cascade folded, and they adopted a, a, uh, an old-growth forest, uh, no old-growth forest trade policy, and covering some other aspects of forestry as well, that, that the people at Rainforest Action Network accept as genuine, and they'll have to enforce it, of course, and make sure that it's not uh, eviscerated in the application, but they feel pretty good about their victory, and I, I think it's a big win. I could tell you ten other similar stories. I just add this point that they are now negotiating with, uh, I can't name it, but w one of the largest banks in this country, which provides capital and credit to probably thousands of corporations. And in some ways, that's where the values are really set. Um, yes, the CEO and his management team is always grinding out numbers to prove that we can squeeze the workers a little more here, just make them work 12-hour shifts. We'll pay them the overtime, but that'll still be cheaper than hiring other employees because that means they get health care and pensions and all those costs. But the financiers are often the ones who say, if you go to 12-hour shifts, <laughs> you'll get a better bottom line, and that's what we want. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're kind of the, the enforcer, in a sense. And not that the corporate CEOs don't go along lovingly with the objectives, but Rainforest Action Network negotiating with this bank is what I think is a, a big leap forward. And yes, it may take a long time, maybe years, before they get an actual, reliable, genuine understanding that this bank is not going to finance that kind of forestry activity anymore. And that sends another ripple through the industry. It's messy. It's not, it's not as pretty and neat as passing a law that says thou shalt not do this anymore. But I have a sense that in some ways it may be more effective because companies, as we know, have developed incredibly sophisticated techniques to blow off laws. They try to block them if they can, but then they tuck loopholes into the laws. And when the law is passed, you look back and you say, gee, not much happened. And if the agency tries to enforce the laws, they go to the court and the companies, you know, blah, 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 on and on. Cutting off their capital is not a long-term threat. It's an immediate threat, and they understand it. So there are lots of techniques, uh, most of them more complex, actually, than what I've just described. But um, And I'm kind of excited when I bopped around this country for a couple of years, talking to people who are doing different versions of them. 
Some of them are failing. Some of them are making limited progress. Some of them are some of them are making breakthroughs. Uh, I don't want to oversell where we are. We're still at the bottom of a mountain, I think. But there's a lot of energy and and momentum there, which I find very promising. It seems one of the really big hurdles to enacting change is getting people the information that they need. And the economy as a whole, I think to your average person, seems like something very complex that we're basically told, no, 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 don't you, don't you dig into this. You listen to our economists, they'll tell you what's, what's going on. How are we going to bridge and get over that hurdle? Well, that's that's where I live, Mike. I mean, that's, what I, that's what I am allegedly doing when I write these books. And, I, and you know, I am I know better than most um, the internals of the big media. I was there at the Washington Post and elsewhere. I'm, it's not a mystery to me how this happened. Um, on the other hand. I've always kind of believed in my guts that, um, and, and see it confirmed. People have a way of finding their way to the truth now and then that wasn't put in front of them by anybody, right? It just, they, they, people learn from their experience primarily, not from the media. And yes, the media infects and influences that. And yes, torrents of propaganda from Wall Street about how We'll take care of your money. You're not. You don't understand this. What we're doing here, but we promise it'll be good. Um, of course. But meanwhile, there are always some souls in the crowd who say that doesn't sound right to me, and they kind of get there. And on this uh, book tour, I've been bopping around the country. I I feel so good, um, not just about the book, but about the really the response of people to something I've been saying to different audiences, and that is when you think about work, the fundamental reality of work in America is that most people, not all, but most, go to work every day in a master-servant relationship, actually inherited from feudalism. And the feudal lord controlled his land. Any of the serfs on that land had to do his bidding. If they didn't, he expelled them. And now think about a CEO who restrains somewhat by modern laws, but not that much, actually. They, the power relationship is pretty much the same. And that, I think, is a, not the only, but one of the core explanations for why Americans feel so cramped in their daily lives and, and powerless. And they are powerless, the way things work now, in many instances. And you know the feeling is a kind of resignation, sometimes cynicism that, uh, you know, you keep your head down and you do what you need to do and hope that you can develop a, some kind of other life outside the work. Work ought to be, I think, the center of life. If you're doing something you enjoy, it's not going to give you all of your human needs, but it, but it ought to give you some. The other aspect of it, which I, I'm not sure people fully understand, but that control system, the, the pyramid in which a few people at the top make the decisions and everybody below follows, is a principal re explanation for the, for, the, for the growing inequality of income and wealth, uh, and always has been. But in, in the fact that inequality of both wages, wage incomes and capital assets has grown more ferociously in the last 20 years is an indication that the power relationship has gotten worse in the last 20 years. And talk to people in workplaces. If with any experience at all, they will tell you, yeah, that's what happened. So I lay this out for folks on the radio or before audiences here and there. And there's a kind of almost exciting instant of recognition. Uh, on, I was on a radio show in Minnesota, Minnesota Public Radio. And a guy called in and said, I was driving to work, and I heard you say that, and I put my fist in the air, and I said, yes. <laughs> sort of like, yes, finally somebody said that. And, he, and then he went on to say he's an owner of a small company. And the interviewer was a little confused, and she said, well, that, makes, that means you're a master, right? <laughs> he said, yeah, I am. But I was an employee, and one of the reasons I started my own company 
was trying to break up that relationship, which is bad for both sides. And, I, and then, again, I won't take them through all of them, but heard from a business professor in this area who said, you know, we've been talking about that. We've had this seminar running with our gr graduate business school students on the relationship of feudalism to capitalism. And we were hitting on some of the same points. And we were thinking, well, we'll do this for a few years and then we'll write a book. And he said, now you've written the book. I mean, I, you, you, know, you can see why uh, that's fulfilling. But it, what it tells me, back to the original problem of how do you get people to see things, is that ordinary folks in, have, have knowledge that is not formally recognized or accepted. They know some things that the textbooks do not teach, that the experts do not themselves recognize. And I, I mean, this is one of the great saving graces of our country, I think, and always has been, that this other reality of what people know is far more complex than either the big media or the polling groups and the focus groups and all that crap, or the political analysis uh, can take in. And so I don't think you have to have mass knowledge of these ideas to make them powerful. You do have to have enough people who inform enough and, and who understand enough to have the nerve to act on them. But it always starts that way, it seems to me. If you look at the, the, the great social movements in, in American history, it always started somewhere with a kind of dedicated minority who really did see a different reality ahead, and they believed in it. And, and, and so that's what we're looking for now. And those people, just to add, come from all over town. This is not, I think, a set of ideas that is, is, it, that is just about liberating the poor from their status or the working poor or, or making things right for blue-collar workers. It goes way up the line. Um, in terms of occupation and status and income. And I think the complaints, although obviously they're different at different places in the society, I think there's more unity about, about anger, about the sort of sense of permanent distress and hopelessness than, than the political polls pick up, um, which to me is a sort of promising starting point for talking to them. Yeah, someone pointed out to me it's, our current system is somewhat intriguing where we supposedly live in a democracy, but for eight plus hours per yeah. day, we uh, we put yeah. that democracy aside and we walk into a situation where someone else uh, calls the shots and we Absolutely. are servants to that. Did you run across examples where people have successfully changed that system from yeah. within? There are a lot of, uh, I don't know, the number bounces around. There are ten or 11,000 employee-owned companies. In, in the country. Many of them, but certainly not all of them, have some form of democratic governance within a culture or a, or a mechanism that, that pretty much guarantees that the employees of every station will be able to participate in the decision making, if only to kibitz or to review or, or to talk back, basically. Others are more supple and, and, and I think effective because they're trying much more seriously to, to draw the knowledge out of everybody. I mean, workers know what's going on in a company and, and they may or may not share that with the managers. Often because if they do tell the managers the truth, they will be punished for it. Because you see, you're putting the managers on the spot by saying, actually your system is screwed up it's terribly wasteful, and you could save a lot of money if you didn't do it that way. You can see how disruptive that is, right? But there's a, there's a movement underway, and I don't want to make it sound like it's broad yet because it's not, but in which a labor union organizes with a Wall Street firm a takeover of a, of a plant that is about to be closed and reforms it. And the example I... I well, among the examples I cite in the book is a company called Blue Ridge Paper, which is five paper plants in a, in a pulp mill in North, North Carolina, owned by Champion Paper, which was going to dump it because Champion Paper was going to was 
prettying up its balance sheet so that it could be bought by international paper at a premium, which happened. And they didn't get a good bid on this on these properties, so they were going to just sell it off. At, you know, sell off the machines, close them down. And the workers uh, there, union and non-union, rebelled because they recognized these are viable assets. This is a productive company. They make juice cartons and milk cartons, and and, uh, and that's a big sector. And they were not, you know, they were not losers by any economic financial standards. So they go to a, a little firm called the KPS Fund, and the, who's the, the the and these guys do direct equity takeovers. They spot a company, they buy it or buy a controlling share, and then they change it. The difference is they don't do it like barracudas. They don't toss stuff out the door and fire workers and, and, and get it in shape to sell back into the stock market. They try to make a different company. And in this case, 45% of the workers, or workers got 45% of the ownership. This equity investing firm holds the other 55%, and they are transforming it. Uh, the, I've got a wonderful resonant a explanation from the one of the partners, Mike Pissarros, and he said, we are taking an oppressive, Stalinist, authoritarian, uh, grim p place to work that's existed that way for 80 years, and we're turning it into a modern 21st century collaborative place where the company relies less on people's bronze and more, brawn and more on their brains. And then I have a labor guy who was a, an, a, an officer in the papermakers union who, who actually prompted the deal, saying very much the same thing and adding, this is hard to do. Because <laughs> when you think about it, you're asking both the manager's side and the worker's side to change themselves, to, to sort of put aside that old relationship that they worked under for years and years, which, which basically says the workers don't have any responsibility. They put in their eight hours. They do what the supervisors tell them, not, nothing else. Keep their mouths shut, and that's the job. And now they're being asked to, hey, you got a stake in this place. What's what's right and what's wrong? Help us, right? And and we'll we'll work it out together. And so it's not an overnight. You don't just by changing the paper and the ownership title doesn't change. You've got to you have to you have to really transform it. But when I and they're and they're going gangbusters. They're they three or four years the equity fund will sell its majority control either to the workers who have first option to buy the whole thing or back into the market and will and will collect an enormous probably thirty five percent annual return on its investment. I mean that's one of the other amusing little secrets of our financial system. The people who do these deals, yes, they accept risk, yes they plunge into the management of the company, but they get they get paid well for their effort, for their risk. I mean, they collect f returns far beyond uh, what average investor can expect. And the, my, one of my sort of dreams of how this system evolves is that pension funds, mutual funds, local investment funds created, say, by the citizens of Puget Sound, they park their some of their savings in this fund with a promise that it will do investing only in enterprises in their region or the state. And it will do it according to certain values. And we know what those values are. And, it'll, and there'll, be, there'll be hard agreements, legal covenants that, could, that are enforceable. We'll give you, give you some capital to help you grow. And in return, you're going to promise to do the following or not do the following. None of this is particularly unusual in, in, in capitalism. That's what happens every day. <laughs> the difference is that you've got now a broader constituency with a different set of priorities and long-term interests than simply the bottom line. Talk about how things have shifted with the uh, investment funds that people put their uh, like their pension funds and things like that mm -hmm. it uh, seemed like for years and, and still seems very much today that it's the people in Wall Street that are in control of that that we as uh, as employees or workers don't really uh, yeah. have any way of steering the boat 
and and um, there is change, but uh, it's it's you're essentially correct that, that that with very few exceptions, the big pension funds um, and their trustees invest very passively, according to the way various Wall Street gurus, analysts, experts, strategists counsel them at, at enormous fees, I might add. And, and the argument is always made, and it's, it's promoted by Wall Street in pretty dramatic fashion, don't let your social aggravations interfere with the investing process. You're only interested in the return. And if you start thinking about the environment or labor conditions or, or the equity of the, of the wage structure inside a company where the CEO is making 500 times the average, you're just going to mess up the returns and so on and so forth. And not surprisingly, most people are intimidated by that and sort of shrug and say, well, yeah, I guess that's right. I need those returns for my retirement. One of the things that's new is that the, that the reality is producing the evidence that just turns those bromides upside down. For s the simplest level, some of the socially responsible investment funds, which really do actively invest, choosing among all of the companies in the market, at a minimum to avoid the bad guys, I mean the real horrible rogues, and maybe to shift their capital toward companies that that really are trying for a more progressive performance. Funds like uh, Domini and Calvert outperformed the broad stock market during the 90s by not inconsequential differences. And they seem to be doing better in the meltdown. <laughs> they're losing too, but, but they're not losing at the rate that the, the standard investing is. That's a really explosive fact, which Wall Street, of course, not, not surprisingly, doesn't want to talk about. But, you know, it's sort of spreading out there. More specifically, um, I talk about a little research firm, which I think has really got the bomb, and uh, called Indovest. And what they've done is a, a sophisticated risk analysis of thousands of corporations here and in Europe, not on their credit risk, but on the financial economic risk of how they behave on environmental pollution, on employee relationships, on governance of the company, uh, on a whole bunch of other, what are really would be kissed off as social concerns, but are in fact economic concerns. And they find the same thing that the, that the funds have demonstrated, which is if you, if you buy a portfolio of 100 companies with the good ratings, they will dramatically outperform the bad guys in their sector by 15, 20 percent, it, it all depends. So what we're missing now is a, is a broad and uh, persistent campaign to take this knowledge to the front door of the pension funds and say, you are violating your fiduciary responsibility to the people who own this money if you n ignore this evidence. And here, I, it wouldn't hurt to have some placards out on the lawn, but I think it, 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 the facts are so powerful. Um, I, think that, I think it's going to be hard uh, for all but the real retrograde characters to, to kiss this off. And then, when we get to the stage where five or six or a dozen major pension funds accept the burden of this evidence and say, okay, now we will start, a, we'll start monitoring the companies we're putting stocks in. And we will shy away from the ones who are demonstrably rogues and time bombs waiting to get in trouble. And we'll shift it to those who aren't, or at least are less bad. That's a, that's a, that's a value-changing force. It's a market force. It's not sentiment. It's not everybody wants to be nice to the environment. It's sort of like if you're not nice to the environment, you're going to have trouble raising capital. And, that, and if you look ahead a little ways, you will see as we gain momentum for these ideas, 
the trouble is going to get deeper and deeper. Now, this is all before anybody's passed a law, right? Mm. But I but I think it's a language which which uh, the moguls understand pretty well. <laughs> I mean, witness we had this situation a week ago when Richard Grasso and this they all make your head swim actually. The head of the New York Stock Exchange, supposedly the regulator who is protecting us from fraud and deception and shenanigans, which is a joke, is revealed he's walking out. He's going to walk home with $200 million as head of the regulatory body, the New York Stock Exchange. And even the, even the moguls choked on that one, right? They were, they were most upset that he's, their, their guy at the stock exchange is making more than they are. I mean, that's, that's, that really is obscene. And then the, the, the head of, the, uh, of CalPERS, which is the California Public Employees Retirement System, and, and they have some, right now about $150, $160 billion. He had a little press conference and said, we think he should go. And it, he was gone two days later. Now, I don't say that CalPERS singularly forced him out, <clears throat> but everybody knows CalPERS is one of those more advanced funds that is willing to take big steps into this area I'm describing. And so that was a kind of weather bell for the whole pension fund industry. And they didn't wait. You know, they didn't have two weeks of discussion. He was gone. So that was just a little sort of for instance of how powerful this can be if if we do the politics of making these funds respond to these ideas. And do you know of any organizations that, uh, in addition to, let's say, CalPERS, which I don't really necessarily, it's, it's obviously a fund, is that correct? It's a retirement. It's a retirement fund for all California public employees. Do you know of organizations that uh, citizens could uh, connect to that would be taking information like Innovest pulls together and uh, starting this ball uh, rolling a little faster? Yeah. Um, well, first they, they should ask, where is my money tonight? You know, I mean, and some people won't have any money in savings because they don't have any savings. Um, and many people will have their, their savings, large or small, parked in fairly innocent and non-risky things like CDs, bank CDs or something. And that doesn't have uh, as much meaning as if they've got stock portfolios and so forth. But they may be connected to an organization, whether it's a labor union or a church or a um, many nonprofit groups have a foundation base. I mean, I would urge them in a nice way <laughs> to ask the question, what are our assets doing in this organization? I mean, do we know, for starters? And if we do, have we looked at the companies we're, we're parking our capital in? Very revealing conversation to, to get into that because you'll find a lot, of the, a lot of the people who see themselves as white hats in this, on these issues are actually financing the other side. And they will say, oh, well, we, that isn't what we had. Well, we're just getting returns here. We're, and that's, of course, that's the question, isn't it? What are you doing with your money? Uh, organized labor, uh, not universally, but in some dimensions, is actually um, in the vanguard on a lot of this stuff. Um, they have a, a, the steel workers, auto workers, paper makers, uh, Unite, uh, which is the old garment workers, cl cl clothing and textiles, and, and particularly the AFL-CIO <coughs> has has a, in the institution now a, a pretty formal um, politic, political front. They don't call it politics, but it is in the generic sense. The Corporate Affairs Department, which runs campaigns against company, but is now also trying to mobilize labor-managed pension funds for this fight. And that's a, that's, that's, that's a kind of tedious and slow because the trustees of these funds are responsible for the money. They can't just walk out the door and park it wherever they th think sounds nice. And they, ha they are accountable, so uh, they can at least be held accountable. So uh, you, can't, you don't get overnight conversions, but I think that work, particularly when it's something like the, the Grasso incident, shows people how 
how much power there is in, in delivering these hard messages. That, um, you know, I would, uh, some of the environmental groups are, are allied with that. Um, I'm, I'm at a loss because there isn't an 800 number you can call and say, oh, I want in the movement. There isn't even a movement, in fact, not at this hour. Um, but I think if people look around at groups that care about these issues, um, they will then and go online and, um, and go on the web and search some of these subjects. Um, a lot of it, of course, is industry propaganda, but, but I think people will be surprised at how much terrific educational information and then sort of leading edge stuff that says this is where the fight is going. And so the, um, the investors have uh, the Council of Institutional Investors, which is less aggressive than I would like it to be, but that's a place where labor pension funds and other progressive p pension funds have, <coughs> have, you know, they share the information and so forth. Um, it's one of those power vacuums where the people in charge are, first of all, intimidated by the financiers, and secondly, they are not used to hearing from the very people they are allegedly responsible to, that is, working Americans whose savings are in play. So, um, you know, I think we'd find out that the, they're more sensitive than we thought they were. It, it look, you know what I mean? It looks like a situation where they, they long ago blew off the, the rank and file and paid no attention to them. But I don't know that they've really been tested on that yet. Mm. Yeah, they probably have completely forgotten about whatever strategies they once had for dealing with this. Yeah, and, and, and you have to appreciate that the Wall Street firms spend a blue fortune to get these funds as clients, customers who will hand over their billions to that firm to invest. And so typically they'll have a lovely seminar to train new trustees of how to run the pension fund. And the seminar will be in Hawaii with a golf course next door. And you know what, you know the drill. And they, and they simultaneously scare the crap out of these trustees, you know. If you make the wrong thing, you can go to prison. And at the same time say, you know, we're your, we're your friends. We'll help you uh, avoid those costly mistakes and so forth. Well, then you look at the history of the last five years. Virtually all of these funds marched up the mountain of the stock market bubble and then fell down the other side. And they spent hundreds of billions of dollars paying these brokers to lead them by the nose through that. So if they start making more of their own decisions and start listening more to the constituencies that are their natural base, I don't think they'll do worse than that. I really don't. I have about uh, 10 minutes left. And um, while I have you here, I, there's, yeah, of course, sure. all we these questions that are just uh, eating away at me. Um, one of the th things I want to ask you is if you could kind of summarize where you think the economy is at right mm -hmm. now. Is, is there any reason for us to feel hopeful at this point? Yeah, let me let me say, Mike, and I don't I can't remember what I did. I've got a website, WilliamGrider.com, G-R-E-I-D-E-R, WilliamGrider.com, where I rant on on the subject of the book, but also lots of other subjects, including the economy, and and it gives you a gives you a quick uh, link to uh, The Nation magazine and my pieces there. And and, uh, and so I hope you'll check it out and, and give me responses, critiques, um, um, comfort, whatever you feel like. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm quite serious. I, I love the fact that you can, you can have conversations with lots of different people, albeit through the electronic screen of the, of the internet, but it's very confirming for me the, the kind of answers I get back. Some of that is is about our current economic situation. And I'm, if you've read my pieces in The Nation over the last six months or so, you will know that I am not optimistic there, quite the contrary, that um, I think this country, like Japan before it, is flirting with what I call a low-grade depression. And I just mean by that, it's not going to be 1932. It, the bottom isn't going to fall out of American life. 
but it will be a stagnant economy that can't recover. <laughs> and it might go on for some years unless the government really gets focused on how to overcome that. And I go through all of the really old Keynesian liberal measures from the 1930s that, that, is, that are needed to pump up stimulus, to help people get out of their debt situation, including corporations, and, and, um, and keep not just the country but the world afloat because I know what it would be like if that doesn't happen. And, and it's, it's just, it's too many people get hurt. And as always, it'll be the people in the bottom half. It won't be the people at the top half. And the world, uh, even though I'm a critic of the global system and believe that it needs serious reform, just as American capitalism does, I'm not for crashing it. <laughs> because, if, because the cost of that in human terms um, is horrendous. And 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 will and will generate um, not just violence, but a kind of ugly reactionary politics that is quite dangerous, not just to us, but to other countries around the world. So, check out those pieces uh, on the in the in my nation's archive. And meanwhile, one of this this is going to sound maybe too precious to people, but one of the reasons I feel so strongly about this book and its optimism is because I do think we're in a bad patch and that it's going to go on a while. And that's, you know, thinking about how we could change things can be an antidote to despair and to reactionary politics. If, if nobody has anything in their heads except this is bad and it's going to get worse and we're screwed, um, that's the ground where demagogues come in and lead them over the cliff with racial hatred or whatever variation of um, and I I know history well enough to know that we're in one of those zones where that's the that's one of the risks and so I'm standing out here with this candle <laughs> in the wind <laughs> trying to get people to think positively about what they can do that they're not helpless that they're that they that there are that there are energies they can contribute to much deeper change than anything the, the government has in mind. And I'd also like to ask you about uh, the recent WTO ministerial that fell apart. What's your take on that? I thought that was great news and, a, and also an opening. Really for the first time in 15 or 20 years, the developing countries found their voice and they stood their ground. And um, it takes an enormous um, fortitude to do, do that, even if you're China or Brazil or India, because the pressure is coming down on you, not just from the U.S. government, but from all of the financiers that you need to, to provide capital and investment funds for the projects you want to build. And the management of multinationals saying, if you don't, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to wreck the WTO, we may not be able to do business in Brazil anymore. So all of this stuff is, they pound, get pounded. But here they, they recognize that for the, the developing countries, especially the small ones, but even the bigger ones, the whole WTO um, trade agreement uh, history is a very one-sided show. And you, you know, some of us have been saying that for quite a while. To get that issue joined at the WTO ministerial and to, and to basically slam on the brakes saying, we're not going to go down this road any farther until you start to recognize our perspective on these things and then give us something more than just more rhetoric. Because that's what the, it's been a charade for quite a long time. And if you watched through the years going back to the late 80s, they would, they'd say these things and then they'd get rolled. And I, yeah, I say that sympathetically. It's, it's, it's hard to stand your ground against that kind of power. So I don't know where this goes. I think Americans um, ought to embrace it as, as, as good news, actually, and say, that's good that these stupid investment rules that the multinationals want, which are really kind of a way to take away a country's sovereignty. They can't do this to outside capital. They can't do that. They can't set rules of development that, that any country should be able to, to do 
in which the U.S. did as a country when we were developing a century ago. All of those, you know, think of that. I mean, Lori Wallach of Global Trade Watch and a whole bunch of other people who, who have been critics of, of, of this process for many years have been trying to get the American media, the big media, to focus on the reality of these trade deals. They're not about tariffs anymore, fundamentally. They're really about the investment terms that are going to be imposed, like NAFTA, on the, on the poor developing country. And those rules, those rules are, are horrendous. I mean, they're really like a, a sort of grab them by the jugular and make them come along. And it's still not a big story in this country, even though it's pretty obvious now. My hunch is that now that Brazil, India, and China, and a bunch of others have, have surfaced that as one of their central issues, maybe, just maybe, the New York Times will take a serious look at it. Or maybe not. I mean, we're still, we're still making headway. Um, I, my own view of the WTO is, is that it's an illegitimate institution. It was founded on illegitimate political premises, very undemocratic never made any attempt to be otherwise. And so I think for lots of reasons, not just from, from the poor country end of things, but from our own and Europe, it's, it's going to fade. Um, maybe that's too wishful too, but uh, I don't think they're going to blow it up and, and abolish it. I think, it, I think it's just, I think people in a few short years are going to decide this is not a, a governance system that the world can live with, and they'll, hope, I hope, try to create a more progressive one, more democratic system. One of the current uh, Democratic candidates for uh, the presidency has proposed, uh, if he made it uh, to the White House, that he would pull the U.S. out of the WTO and NAFTA. Do you think that's possible, and, and uh, what would be the repercussions of that economically? Well, it'd be sort of like a 100 megaton bomb at the center of the global system. I'm not against that. Um, I mean, I, who was that, Dennis Kucinich? Yeah, Dennis yeah. Kucinich. I, I mean, I'm, I think the principle is absolutely right. I think, I think you can get the same effect without <laughs> destroying life as we know it by simply saying, I'm president now, and I am commissioning the following ten wise people, and I would have Nader or Lori Wallach in among them, to figure out how we can get out of the WTO and NAFTA because they're both horrible. And that would send people skittering under rocks and <laughs> diving off cliffs. I mean, it would be, just the announcement effect would be, would be um, very powerful. And then you could begin a, ne a negotiation that says, here are, here are our six, eight, 12 complaints about the way the system works now, and we propose to get these changed, or yes, we will withdraw. I mean, I don't think you need to do those simultaneously. I think, I actually think, and I wrote this in One World Ready or Not six, seven, eight years ago, the gulf between rich and poor regions, so forth, is so great. It is, it, it, it's a kind of an elite folly to think that you can have one building in Geneva <laughs> that's somehow responsible for all that and that can be trusted to be genuinely neutral among the conflicting interests. So that I think, if, I'm not against the, per, the global integration of, econo of economies per se, I'm, I'm against the way this one proceeds. And I think it might actually be healthier for the world if everybody took a step back and said, let's work on regional blocks first. And that's anathema to the free traders, they don't, they don't want that. But you take South Asia and, and maybe North Asia and parts of Latin America and so forth and so on, and the United States sets up some relationships with those which don't apply to the whole world, but then that invites the possibility that the United States, because we're so wealthy, also takes some development responsibility for those countries. That is schools, health, roads, you know, the infrastructure, which really does start them down the road to genuine development rather than just kind of little zones of industry where, uh, which are kind of islands in the society. 
and yes, provide jobs and low wages, but don't really begin to build the society in ways that, the ways that we did as a country um, in the 19th century. Um, we may be heading towards something of that as the, as the center, the WTO, and the United States as all-powerful leader lose their influence. And that'll be bemoaned, and there'll be learned books written about how awful it is. I think it's, as a practical matter, I think it may be the best next step we can find. Now, I, I'm, I'm not against recreating international institutions like the ones that Bretton Woods tried to create right after World War II that really do stabilize the financial flows and stuff like that. I mean, if, if I saw any leaders around the world in governments anywhere in the world who were talking that way, I would be more hopeful, but I don't. The only folks who are talking actually progressively in these terms are the ones in the street. And, um, and that's good. That, that'll go on for a while until governments begin to get out of the way or wake up. All right. Well, if people want to uh, get a hold of you, uh, can you tell us again how they can uh, it's, uh, find you? Uh, you? You can contact through my website, which is williamgreider.com. That's G-R-E-I-D-E-R. -E and, uh, uh, and you'll hear back from me. Very good. Well, just been talking with William Greider, national affairs correspondent for The Nation and author of numerous books, including Who Will Tell the People, Secrets of the Temple, and his latest book, The Soul of Capitalism, Opening Paths to a Moral Economy. Uh, William, thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Mike. I enjoyed it.